welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Jessica Ganzi. Jessica, welcome. Thank you so much, Guy. Thank you. You are welcome. So Jessica serves as senior program manager within the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. She's a native of Detroit, Michigan, and holds a Bachelor of Science in Hospitality Management from Ferris State University and Master of Divinity from Vanderbilt Divinity School. Her expertise lies in Black church studies, a religious movement born out of persistent othering within the white spaces. Jessica's work endeavors to create the mental and environmental conditions for people to be fully seen, loudly heard, and thrive personally and professionally. In her teaching role over the past decade, she has both challenged and empowered faith leaders and religious communities alike through the decolonization of sacred text and praxis and by centering marginalized voices in shaping theological understanding. Whoa. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Before we get going here, share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Sure. So I am originally from Detroit, Michigan. That is my home space. That is uh, where it all began for me. And um, I actually lived for quite a while, too, um, in Los Angeles, California. So uh, both of those I consider to be home. Currently, uh, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, Uh, me and my husband, my amazing son. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So what a really interesting um, bio, and I'm sure that you are, are obviously more interesting than just the written words on your bio, but it, it's really interesting to me. How did all this start for you, and what exactly do you do? Sure. So um, th- what I do currently um, is it, sort of outline like what you mentioned. I, I currently work with uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center as a senior program manager doing uh, diversity and equity and inclusion work. And so um, a part of that is, you know, of course, dealing with the environment, right? It's uh, addressing things that uh, create barriers for people to thrive or to be themselves, whatever the case. But it's also um, dealing with diverse populations. Of course, when you're dealing with that, you have inherent differences and inherent conflicts. Um, But figuring out ways that we can find commonalities among these differing beliefs and perspectives across the board and finding where we can uh, come together to be respectful, to be, you know, loving as a particular goal, uh, but um, but also um, to, to create an environment, again, by which mm-hmm. uh, we can grow and thrive. So uh, I grew up uh, with uh, with my grandmother, who was a gardener. And so um, she taught me a, a great deal about what it means to set the ground for something to grow. Right. And so um, with that, I take that in everything that I do. If it, it doesn't make sense if we just make a, a comment, hey, we want to be diverse. We want to be equitable. We want to be inclusive. That's great. Um, but what does the ground say? What does the ground of our organization say? What, how, did, how are these structures set up um, to either reinforce that particular goal um, or block it? And so I believe it's our responsibility in those particular offices to be um, accountability partners and uh, to just sort of gatekeep that very, um, you know, beautiful thing that we call like organizational culture and, and make sure that folks can uh, take can come and be. And whenever that is being threatened or violated, then we have to step in and we have to do something. So that's the kind of work that I do. How I came to that work, um, I come to that work via religious space. So um, I have, again, a a divinity degree, but even before then, I I worked doing Christian education work. Um, And again, my particular you know, faith, uh, faith uh, stances uh, in the in the Christian uh, denomination. Uh, however, uh, I am 
a, a friend of all religions. And so uh, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, I've had some experiences during my time uh, in religious spaces, being the person that, you know, you, you teach and you preach the things that, that you think, you know, are correct, uh, that you are also taught are, you know, tenets of your faith. Mm-hmm. And you may not realize it at the time. Sometimes the things that you may be saying are harmful. And what I was learning in this process um, as I was going through um, just my own evolution is that in sometimes, and I'm speaking particularly to a uh, religious space, particularly around the Christian um, faith, sometimes doing something harmful may be considered virtuous. And and that's where we get hung up, right? For example. So a good example of that is we can say something very easy, like, you know, love the person, hate the sin, right? Mm -hmm. A, we haven't really dug deep to even unpack what the sin is, who's naming that as sin, who, you you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We haven't even done all that unpacking. And we've told ourselves that there is a way to sort of differentiate people from their beliefs or their customs, who they are. But we know in praxis, that is not true because if, you know, the things that you do, everything that you do, I say, I don't like anything you do, God, but I love you. It's like, no. And people know when they're being loved and when they're being tolerated. Mm -hmm. And so um, therein lies where people get pushback. Right. And you Mm -hmm. think, oh, good, I'm getting pushback. I must be on the right way. Uh, You know, folks not going to like when I'm telling the truth and things of that nature. And so a pivotal moment for me was during my time uh, at a seminary while I was in Michigan. Um, It was the day after the Mike Brown verdict. And so um, we're dealing, of course, in a time where there's a lot of racial tension in our country, a lot of things that are going on. And I recall coming to school that day and it was really like business as usual. OK, no problem. No, no one seems uh, out of out of whack about anything. Now, maybe a few weeks earlier was the uh, decision that came down from the Supreme Court to legalize same-sex marriage. And I remember coming into the school the day after that, and it was like chaos. Mm -hmm. It was like people were really, really, really concerned. And there was a lot of chatter going on, and it was just an uproar. And I, I paused because I was thinking, I feel so shattered on the inside, and I'm so hurt about, you know, this particular injustice, and no one's bothered. No one's bothered. Now, in this setting, I'm the only uh, Black female in the program. Um, There is a predominantly white male space. Um, More white females in the space were in, not in like uh, your your MDiv programs, they were in uh, therapy. So they were um, preparing to be counselors. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was sort of like the heavy lifting of preaching and teaching. They really tried to discourage a lot of women from going into those spaces. So I have both sexism that I'm dealing with, but then I also have this issue of like uh, racialized tension, like what's going on here. And so as I started to ask them questions, um, because I started to feel very uncomfortable, I had to say, how are we saying we are one body? We say we're one body in Christ. That's a thing. Mm-hmm. But my, if the toe hurt, wouldn't the whole body feel it? And so how is it that certain communities are hurting and, and no one's feeling this? And so that's when I decided that we must be talking about two different things. And mm-hmm. I must be in a setting that I'm evolving away from. And that's what led me into uh, my time at Divinity School, because I wanted to divest from spaces that I didn't feel um, accepted in, which I think people should do as a part of their own self-care. Um, and in that journey, I began to evolve as a spiritual person, as a spiritual leader. And I began to see that my freedom that at the time I looked at particularly just around uh, a race or gender, but I started to realize this is not the only thing that's at stake, but that my freedom is so intricately wrapped up 
and someone else's and particularly marginalized folks. So that could be a person with disability. That could be a person that's neurodivergent. That could be, you know, all, or all sorts of things that um, maybe even religious difference. And so those are, that's where it started to become like very apparent to me that, oh my goodness, I think I've been riding the wave of, of Christian supremacy mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and people get harmed in that. And I beforehand didn't think that it was a problem. And now I'm starting to see that it is. So what do I do to fix this? And my religion um, informs me that if you want to get certain things right, you have to go through a process we call repentance. And repentance is not just merely like, hey, God, you know, my bad. I'm sorry. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, But it's God saying, you know, what exactly are you repenting about? You may want to confess that. And now I got to own the things that I've done. And I find myself calling people saying, I've said these things about you as a gay person, or I've said these things about you as a person of another faith. And I apologize for what I said. And I was wrong Mm -hmm. in trying to make amends. And I found freedom in that. And I found a great burden lift that I didn't even know that I was carrying. And now I knew. I think this is the path that I need to be on and how can that extend Mm -hmm. beyond just um, religious space, but also into workspaces, other spaces like that. Wow. I mean, first of all, just the way you articulated your background and how you got into everything. I didn't even have to ask you a question. I really appreciate that. (laughs) But, you know, as you're talking, Jessica, I'm thinking to myself, um, first of all, there's something so beautiful in, in, in your energy and the way you speak and what you're doing and your mission, it's really inspiring. And I'm also thinking to myself, we live in such a challenging world, such a fractured world now, right? Um, This, this, this topic of inclusivity and honoring each of us, it it seems so challenging. Absolutely, it is. <laughs> how do you how do you in this idea of and before when you were saying, you know, sometimes we we respect the the person, but we can kind of disregard the the sin. That seemed very similar to me. Like, well, you know, you're not a bad person. You just made a bad choice. <laughs> you know, we, we say that a lot and mm-hmm. there's a certain amount of, right. Well, not all people are, are bad if they make bad choices, but how do you, how do you include people who don't want to be included, who aren't being respectful, who aren't honoring your beliefs or my beliefs? Absolutely. So should we even try <laughs> to do that? <laughs> um, being a person that has admittedly done harm before, I can say that I think it's certainly worth the try because being informed by my faith says that when God creates everything, he creates it good. And and so we start from a good place. We don't start from a sinful place. We start from a good place. Sin the way that I define that is what what removes me out of community. It's it's when I do something, I'm not defining what that is, but when I do something that puts me in bad relationship with my other humankind. It's when I accept something or I allow something that can be harmful to myself or the next person that to me is is sin. It's that when we do something that draws um, space between us and our fellow humans and then us and God, right? Um, God being that which gives me life and, and leads and guides me into all things that are well, right? So I believe that people evolve. I don't, I don't believe that and I believe that everyone has an opportunity to evolve. And I and I also believe that some people simply refuse the opportunity to do so. Mm-hmm. 
I think that um, inclusivity can be the goal, right? And you can still play in wisdom that lets us know that in order for it to seriously be inclusive and in a safe way, certain things are not allowed, right? So I think we have to be really um, intentional and really clear about what we mean by inclusion Mm -hmm. and, and what is to be included and things of that nature, because we don't want, um, it it would be hard to create inclusive space. Of course, if I have a strict hatred for all of who you are, what you represent, right? So Mm -hmm. how can you feel safe? Right. So so those are things that we have to say. These are the things that violate what inclusion can do for us. Right. Mm. So I think that that we we have a goal of inclusion, but wisdom informs us that we may not get all the way there with everybody and that that is okay. Also, the pace by which we get to whatever that is, right? Because it's not like a destination either, per se. And I, I hate that I use that language, but um, it, it's just a, a way of being. The pace by which people make it to those points look very different. I've seen people who come alive better in themselves later on in life after a variety of type of experiences that get them there, as opposed to maybe another person who has their aha moment in their mid Mm twenties, right? Those sort of things. Or people who simply were exposed much early on to a fuller range of inclusive environment by which they are able to interact with varying religions, with uh, varying persons um, uh, that, you know, play in the scope of sexuality, just all of those different things. It doesn't bother them. But me coming out of religious spaces where there is, moralities are defined and it's like rights and wrongs and Mm -hmm. good and bad people and very like, you know, dualistic type of understandings of of folks, whereas life is so very gray, um, then then that's where sometimes we're having a a harder, a harder moments. How do you get a well-meaning and intended person to understand that they may be doing something that's not well and that to change it means to challenge their very core beliefs. And, and that's where you get crisis of faith, right? Because I have to go to a, a three crisis of faith in order to be, quote unquote, delivered <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, from that kind of thinking and being with brothers and sisters and siblings of the world, right? And get to a place where I can now champion and do certain things on all of our behalf, not just on their behalf, because people have a voice. So pass the mic. I don't have to speak up for everybody. Mm-hmm. I, sometimes I just need to move out the way. Right. But it's it's I think that's a particular goal. But wisdom does inform us that all the time we're not going to get there with everybody. And that's OK. Mm-hmm. And But that we can, can still continue to go because we have choices. Right. And I can't force you to love me or to mm. respect me or to honor me, right? Um, and so I learned how to dig deep within my own self. And that's where we empower people. Dig with deep within your own self. And that's enough to feed you your own level of dignity and worth and self-empowerment because you may not get that from everybody. But even if you don't, you will be well, you will be fine and there are communities that you belong to. Um, you know, but that that is something that is gonna constantly be with us, you know, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Give me an example, if you could, about how you work specifically within your professional environment. Sure. So um, our office do three main things. We we educate, we train, we advocate. And and we're a fairly new office as well. Um, Our office was birthed out of um, a, a greater plan, what we call the racial equity plan. And that is VUMC's uh, outline commitment to anti-racism work and evolving into an anti-racism space um, and also the ways that we can um, empower our communities through um, our VUMC community, our workforce community through uh, DEI efforts. 
And so within our space, uh, people come to us for a variety of reasons. Hey, we're having this uh, trouble with, um, you know, our nursing group. Uh, You know, this person is feeling a way about this person and maybe we need some training. Mm -hmm. And so uh, sometimes we have the particular expertise to do the training. Other times we bring in people that are more qualified, um, depending on as we sit and we talk with these groups trying to discern what is the real issue here? What is some underlying stuff here? Sometimes people just have mistrust of their management. And so they're just not, they're, they're, they're not, you know, in sync. So we have to figure out what that looks like. We have to say, if there is say a reprimand uh, of a particular um, member of our, of our workforce community, they've done something wrong. Um, HR has stepped in, uh, they've been reprimanded for whatever, however that looks. Then we also come back to those offices to say, how do those work units heal then um, when there's been certain fractures, right? Because it's difficult when you done got in trouble essentially at work um, to go back around uh, uh, folks that you you may feel a way about or You know, there's all types of stuff that's happening with that. So we also try to be mindful that it's not just enough that, hey, this person did the right thing and this person did the wrong thing. And we addressed the person and did the wrong thing. So we did what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. We're saying, but if we're going to be in community for real, we still have after work to do um, to help those units still come back together when they can at least attempt and and try to get to that inclusive space. Right. And and. a, a working environment that that feels safe where they can show up and they can continue on where they don't feel like that, you know, I'm not wanting here anymore. I need to divest. Mm-hmm. Right? So those are a few things. How did you get to this point where this became a focus for you? Um, I think it just naturally occurred. Um, the the last probably 10 years I've spent doing Christian education works, so I work directly with congregations. Mm-hmm. And that's a very personal job. Um, and it's 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 fun, and, but it's challenging. And so I think I, I really enjoy that, you know, interpersonal connection with different folks. And what you find, especially in congregations, you know, you sit, you talk, you learn about one another. You're you're you you do a lot of storytelling and you hear a lot of stories. And you you weave all that together to say, okay, we're in community and we're in community with folks that have varying types of backgrounds and varying types of experiences and that sort of thing. So this to me uh, was a very natural shift over, even though it's not in congregational uh, ministry, it's still with a nonprofit. Um, but I'm still dealing with people. That mm-hmm. That's really what it comes down to is that I'm just dealing with people. And these are people that have souls. These are people that have things that weigh on their souls. These are people that regardless of background, they want to be loved. They want to be cared for. And I do feel like um, even in our own disagreements, there is somebody that feels like they want the best for somebody else. Now, how we get there, that's that's our debating and our challenges. But I think that we all share those core things. So if I can get people to understand that, A, first and foremost, again, drawn from my own uh, faith experiences, you are a good person. I believe you're a good person. And that and, and maybe your dis, uh, misinformation or traditions or whatever the case, you could be doing something that's not good for it for yourself or for another person Mm -hmm. but there is a way to to bring you back and we want you to be on that team with us right now i've set up a situation where they have some belonging some support but we've called out what it is but to call out a person and leave them out there all you're going to get is defensiveness for sure And that's still going to happen sometimes just when people feel like they feel attacked or something. Right. But I think that when you have a space to say the goal is that I'm calling you back into community. That then we have somewhere to go. And so um, it's no different to me, at least um, doing the work that I did in a very pastoral way as well with churches that I do over here. You know, it's interesting, as we've been talking, we haven't even mentioned the word trauma (laughs) at all. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, specifically when we're talking about, you know, interpersonal trauma, um, 
that in in a sense is a very definition of exclusion. The person who's been traumatized, they're often feeling completely uh, uh, neurobiologically ex- excluded even from themselves, there's no, there's a very difficult uh, path to getting back to their self-belief, their self-esteem, their self-worth. How do you square, Jessica, the the challenges that have been leveled against Christianity, right? Some people have said, well, you know, Christianity on the far right can be exclusionary, how do you square that with the work you do? I mean, obviously there are different factions in all religions, right? There, there are extremists in all religions, but talk to that in a little, in a, in a bit. Sure. So um, the, first and foremost, I, I had to come to a particular terms with, with my own religion, right? So um I had to be able to understand like what you mentioned, these um, extremes, if you will, right? And I had to land somewhere that felt home for me. That came with the blowing up of what I foundationally knew. That's that's a part of a particular crisis or trauma because if you're told your whole life the sky is blue, and come to find out at 30, you learn that the sky was yellow. Um, Now you have a lot of questions about a lot of other things, right? And that's essentially what happens when deep-rooted beliefs are challenged and then dismantled. And that's Mm -hmm. what I mentioned earlier, what was happening to me that helped me to evolve, right? And so um, you will find for yourself sometimes... um, floating in a space that feels like an abyss, like I'm not really sure where I land. I don't even know where to go. Uh, What I thought I knew, I don't think I know anymore. What's going on here? This is similar things that happen when we bring up DEI topics, when we're talking about racism, when we're talking about sexism, when we're talking about all of these different things. When we start to break down how these isms or these what we call evils work or function and how they function maybe through people, your your most good and well-intended person who see themselves as good <clears throat> are saying, oh my goodness, could I, a, the very good person, do wrong? Oh, oh God, no. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I'm not a racist. I'm not a sexist person. I'm not a homophobic person. Not me. I love everybody. Right. And what we're trying to do is show you how there may be some gaps Mm -hmm. and and how your love may flow. Right. And it's going to be so important for for folks to understand it. So when they're being challenged with that, they're going through a similar crisis. I'm using crisis, but it can feel like trauma. Right. Like what? what, What do you mean? What just happened? And how do I do that when I don't have the language to to express what I'm feeling? I just feel super disoriented when I feel like this is a faith that has held me together in certain moments of my life. And now is a faith that feels untrustworthy. Um, What do I do with it? Do I throw it away? Do I keep it? (laughs) Mm -hmm. What do I do with it? People in in my space, because I'm not dealing with them specifically around their religions, even though that comes up sometimes, uh, particularly around the holidays um, and their their celebrations. Uh, But they're coming to work with their particular things that hold them together, their their support systems that hold them together. So when we start making assessments about certain things that they're starting to put put it together, like, I have a support system that loves me, but I'm honest enough to know that my same support system may not love everybody. Mm-hmm. Well, do I throw them away? Do it right. So they're going through the same thing. And I think that as people, it's so important that we do things in community. The challenge is finding the community to do it in. I want to do it in community. I want to feel like I belong, but, but where do I go? And where do I go when um, I hold a particular belief system that informs me not to go to certain places or certain people for it because they're inherently bad? Mm-hmm. 
there, those sort of things, right? So you feel really stuck and you have to start making some big decisions about all of that aside, who do I want to be in this life? What part? So now I'm not thinking, well, God, what do you want me to do? I'm starting to ask, who do I need to be? Who do I need to be? Because if I keep trying to, you know, do something, <clears throat> then I'll put myself always in a position like I don't really have, you know, a lot of a lot of things to do for myself. I don't have a lot of work to do for myself. I have a lot of giftings and I can give the world this and give the world that and do. But when I start talking about who I need to be, well, now I got to do a lot of inter mm -hmm. introspection and we don't spend enough time doing that. And, and so when we're not doing introspection, sometimes we're believing things or we're sprouting things that we say we believe that really we don't. Mm -hmm. Or we're saying that we don't like something that really we do. And, but we haven't done enough introspection, reflection, and just honest talk and just honest talk for us to get to a place where we can say, ah, I, uh oh, I think I'm going to say it. I don't like chocolate around all the chocolate lovers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's okay. Like those, but it's like, it's deeper. I'm using that just playfully, but it can be something very deep that says my belief system, uh, the way that I interpret it too. That's the other thing. It's not all the time that is telling me that. It's sometimes that I am interpreting that incorrectly. Mm -hmm. But my interpretation leads me to be mean to these folks. And that's okay. I should be, right? But if I'm being honest, it bothers me to see me being mean to another person. Because I know that's not deserving that I don't I don't do that. I don't I I must show dignity and honor to all people. So if I get honest, I may say, I'm not about to do that. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not going to I'm not going to harp on a person for doing this or being this way, those sort of things. So we have a lot of growing to do. And <clears throat> the traumas of that is is still rooted a lot of times in our childhoods and our upbringings and in our transitionary moments and stuff like that, because speaking up. It's hard to do mm -hmm. when you're conditioned to not. When 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 the virtue is humility and silence, when it's turned the other cheek, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Just let stuff go. Just let it go. Just oh, they don't mean it that way. Oh, be the bigger person. I can't keep being the bigger person. I, I can't. Um, those sort of things. It's like if I got to keep being the bigger person, am I around too many small people? Like what's mm -hmm. going on? Right. Because we want to be in a reciprocated community. And so those are challenges that still we all have in DEI spaces. We're always telling people, we want you to speak up. We want you to, you know, advocate and do all this stuff. But what happens if I speak up and, they, and I get fired? Mm -hmm. Right. What happens if I speak up and not one person in the room uh, got behind me? They did after the meeting, though. Oh, that was mm -hmm. so good, guy. I'm so happy you mentioned it. You're like, where were you when right, <laughs> they were right. coming from? That's hard. We're asking people to do some hard stuff without support. And so we have to be able to um, address different things from a variety of angles to try to get more people um, moving around the things that they really say mean, mean something for them. You know, as we kind of wind down here, um, <laughs> What you're doing to me, uh, the things that are coming up for me are self-awareness, the importance of having self-awareness, the importance of Absolutely. being intentional, being compassionate and self-reflective, all of which uh, can be hard for a lot of us. <laughs> and especially when we're under stress, yeah. when we're under pressure, when okay. we come from an environment where those words have never been mentioned before. That's right. Um, my gosh, I'd love to have you back and continue this discussion. You, you just have this amazing presence, Jessica. You really do. I love it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I'd love to. I'd love to. I appreciate that. So um, if people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? Sure. So one way um, is through my website. It's uh, Jessica Gansey, 
dot com. Okay. So really simple. Uh, JessicaGanzi.com. And through that site, you can learn a little bit more about uh, sort of consulting work that I do um, along with churches. Um, and also there's a contact area. So uh, you can get in contact with me uh, via that way. Also through uh, just my email, okay. uh, which is JessicaGanzi dot, uh, at gmail.com. Just uh, so I try to keep it simple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So um, those are two ways uh, that I can be reached. Um, and then also, of course, um, through uh, social media. Um, I, and actually, I won't say through social media. I'm on and off social media all the time. Okay. So I, I wouldn't want to make that my my main thing. But certainly my email and through the site, uh, that's probably going to be uh, my most primary. Appreciate that. Uh, awesome, Jessica. Super inspiring. And can't wait to talk to you again. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Guy. Thank you for all the work that you do as well. Appreciate that. Take care. Take care.